run to an open, or if you're out looking and on a corner for a major intersection, there are 13 for sale, or uh, yeah, open house signs. You know, I'm not lazy, but I'm not going to be the 14th. I've got 13 of my peers that are telling everybody to come see me already. So I'm not going to bother. I'm not going to put a sign there. I really do. I have whether it's eight or ten. I don't care what the number. Everybody has to have theirs there. Well, I would be kidding myself and very naive if I really believe the reason they're there is to find my West USA open house. You know, they're there because it's an area they're interested in that they've got some interest, you know, in pursuing. That's exactly why they're there, and that's fine. So, you know, those are some of the things you want to think about. So now I go down to the next street where I have to turn. Well, I've got six of them still telling people to come see me. I'm not going to put a sign up there. You know, and so that's one of the ways you might be able to do it, you know, with, with that, especially if you have others. Um, but open houses can be a tremendous, tremendous source of picking up business. And I'm going to share with you a little bit a story that I've shared with a couple of you already. Uh, when it comes to open houses, but working unrepresented sellers, or formerly, what are they? Fizbo. Yeah, those FISBOs, those for sale by owners, um, working with those, working with expired listings, developing your sphere of influence. Now, the two things, I mean, working a geographic farm, that was another area where Russ said, I'm not going to farm. I've been doing this all these years. I've never had to farm. Well, guess what? Any of you in his area where you get his monthly uh, newspaper, he is now farming and has been for a couple of years. You know, again, one of the things he started looking at as the market changed is, where can I go, what can I do, what do I have to do to make even more money? One of the areas that he identified, I mean, besides the REOs and the short sales, was he said, you know what, I don't farm. Maybe it's time for me to start farming. Well, he talked with Joseph and Joanne Calloway. They absolutely believe in farming. And like I said, they can share more of their story with you this afternoon, but uh, they absolutely believe in it. So they shared some ideas and thoughts with Russ. And Russ now does geographic farming also. It's kind of like looking at those money-making opportunities. Where are the voids that I can fill in and you know make some money as a result of it? So those are all different areas. There are only two things for us to do. One is prospecting and the other is marketing. That's, that's our job. Prospecting and marketing. Because if you're not prospecting, you know what, you're never going to get you know, any business. I mean, you really aren't. Uh, you've got to have somebody that you can work with. As I talked to all of these different people and said, okay, what's working and what isn't working and how are you doing it? There were two things that came out loud and strong. Number one for every one of them was developing their spheres of influence. They said, you know what? We've been in the business nine years. I've been in the business 15 years. And all of a sudden it dawned on me that all of these people that I send a Christmas card to or a holiday card of some sort, I haven't talked to them maybe in eight years, 10 years. Every year I get some back. You know, that where they've moved on to someplace else. So I take them off my list because obviously they did something without me. So they said, you know, when things are a bit slower, now's the time to identify those people. Now is the time to start developing them once again. Now, it was kind of interesting because some salespeople have asked, okay, but Marge, if it's been five or six years or longer, how in the world do I now approach them and admit to that? Because they're going to know and they may not even remember <coughs> me. Now that's, that's a tough one to swallow because we remember them, or think we do, but it is highly possible they don't remember us. And I said, well, you know, it's up to you. Well, maybe with those, if it's been just a year or less, I should go ahead and develop them. Well, why, why skip the others? Why skip the others? A lot of them, you know, may have moved on, that's fine. A lot of them may have made some changes, but wouldn't it be nice to know instead of leaving something behind? And I said, what's wrong with just picking up the phone and saying, you know, thank goodness we have a lull in the market right now. Things have slowed down enough that I actually have some time to get back and talk with people that are important to me whom I've ignored unintentionally for years. And gosh, just all of a sudden I realized, you know, every, every holiday, I send you a card. 
but I haven't talked to you, and I'm, I'm embarrassed to say I don't even know how long, if it was five years, if it's ten years, but all of a sudden I wanted to say, how are you, what's happening, and say hi. I said, what's wrong with saying that? Well, yeah, but then how do you ask him for business? And I said, maybe you do, maybe you don't. You know, I'm still in the real estate business, and if you ever have any needs, I'm still here. If you have friends or relatives or business associates or somebody that has a need, just know that I'm here, and I promise not to ignore you in the future. What's wrong with it? They know that you're in business. What's wrong with telling them? You know, one of the things that I've said many, many, many times and really believe is you've got to get it in here if you're going to get it out of here. You've got to get it in here if you're going to get it out of here. I've got to know what I want to say. I need to know what my message is so that I can project it and I'm going to sound it like a professional. And if it has been years, well, now I'm going to tell them. You know, and I'm sorry that that happened. But you develop some kind of a script. Why walk away without giving yourself a fighting chance to let them know that you really would like to, you know, reestablish that relationship with them. What was interesting to me, and one of the reasons that I absolutely love this, is there was a gentleman at one of the National um, Association of Realtors conventions who shared with us the way he developed his sphere of influence. And he said, what I did was I gathered names from everything, a school alumni directory, church directory, uh, civic group or organization that he belonged to, business associates from you know his wife's place of business, whatever it is. He gathered all of these names and he said, I put them on my dining room table. And the reason he put them on the dining room table, he said, it was after Christmas and it was after Thanksgiving, that's the only time we ever use it. So he had lots of room that he could work with. And so he said, I spread them out and I thought, okay, what I want, this was his goal, what I want is 100 of these people to go to work for me today free. But now I have to decide which hundred because I had thousands of names to select from. So he established three, three criteria to determine who was going to go on that list. The first one, and he said the most important, was to ask himself how socially active and influential are they? How socially active and influential are they? And it's not to say that somebody who just, you know, sits at home, uh, you know, doesn't have that much exposure, not to say that they're not wonderful people, but he's looking for 100 employees to go to work for him. The more people they know, the more active they are, the higher the probability he's going to get some referrals. So he said that was the number one criteria. Number two, how much rapport do I have with them? And he said, by rapport, what I need is to know that I've got somebody, like if I walked up and said hi to Larry, and Larry could say, well, hi, Marge, how are you? That's enough. We don't have to be you know, social buddies. We don't have to go to dinner at his house or my house or something. But he knows who I am. So if he gets something in the mail or if he gets some kind of a call, he's at least going to know who I am instead of saying, I don't know who this is, and just kind of push it to the side. So how much rapport do I have with them? And then the third is, will they go to work for me? That's the key. Will they go to work for me? And you say, well, how in how the world are you going to know? Well, they're going to tell you. So what he did was he sat there, and he'd go through the list, and he's looking and saying, oh, yeah, yeah. They know everybody, and they know me. So he'd write the name down. He said, when I get to the point of having six, eight, nine names, he said, then I'd take a break, get up and move and stretch and have coffee or pop or whatever he's going to have. And he said, then he sat down and called them. He wanted to give himself a little bit of diversion. He'd call them and say, well, let's see how it, Ruth, I was just sitting here writing out a list of the most socially active and influential people that I know, whom I really, really like and trust. And boy, your name's right at the top of my list. And he said, you know, people said, but that sounds so different. He said, well, but isn't that honest? That's my number one criteria. How socially active and influential are they? Do I have rapport? And it's true. He said, it was a heck of a lot easier for me to just tell them what I was doing than it was to try and make up something different for everybody. He said, now, the only thing I would tell you, you don't say to them, by the way, you're the 84th person I've called today. He said, don't go there, because if you have literally hundreds, if not thousands of names, 
then they are at the top of the list and it will apply. So he chose to just use that. You know, I'm sitting here writing on a list of the most socially active, influential people I know, like, and trust. Your name's at the top of my list. He said, they'll either say, wow, thanks, or okay, what do you want? Uh, but I have no idea, are you suspicious? It's true, that's what I'm looking for. And actually, the reason I am making the call is because I'd like to know if and when you have a real estate need, or if you run into somebody who does, you know, would you refer them to me? See, if they can't do the job that you're hiring them for, if they don't know what that job is. So you gotta tell them. So that's what he did. And when I say, will they go to work for you, which was his third part, they might say, well, gosh, you know what you don't understand, Marge, is we can't do that. Um, and the reason we can't do that is, you know, our son is now in real estate. and He'd disown us if we went someplace. Okay, that's great. Who's he with? That's wonderful. Maybe we'll have a cross sale one day. You know, and that's fine. Well, then you don't put them on your list. It's real simple. But he said, as many times as I've shared this story with people, realtors don't do it. They just don't do it. He said, I tell them you gotta talk to them, you gotta get in front of them. He said, no, what they'll do is they'll just identify it and they start doing mailings to them. Because overall, industry-wide, we're lazy. Now, he started this program when he was doing it. He started this program in April. By December of that year, so a little less than eight months later, from that one activity alone, he'd made over $77,000. I know a lot of us would like to make 77000 ever, <laughs> but in, in less than eight months, that's how much he made as a result of that one activity alone. To me, it's worthwhile. He said what he did, when they said yes, we'll be happy to, he said, then what I did was I'd send them a thank you note and I would enclose six business cards. Now, here's how scientific his process was. When he decided he was going to send this, he went to a postage scale. And what he did was he took the envelope and the thank you note and then started dropping business cards on the, you know, the scale until it went to extra postage. <laughs> and then he'd take it off because he wanted to be able to mail it with one stamp. Now, I don't know what it would take today because I don't know the weight of your cards or anything else you're going to do, but that's how scientific his process was. And on the note, it was just very informal where he'd say, you know, uh, thanks, Ruth. If you need more cards, you let me know. I'll talk with you again soon. Just short and sweet. But it was personal, and he sent it off, and he sent her cards. You know, and it was just really that simple. So he said, okay, so now by doing that, I've communicated with them twice this year, which is more than he had done with many of his clients and, or past clients, and twice because he picked up the phone and called her and talked to her, sent her something in writing. Now, he chose to go further and he subscribed to a newsletter. So he would put them on the mailing list so they'd get the newsletter. So that now meant they were going to hear from him every month thereafter. So now this year, they would go to 14 contacts, which was far more than he'd ever done for anybody. But he thought that wasn't good enough either. So in addition, he put it into a follow-up system and said, at least once a quarter, I'm either going to make a point of seeing them face-to-face -face or at a minimum talking to them on the phone. So. There are over 21 contacts in a year. Because that old adage, out of sight, out of mind, is real. It is absolutely real. Now, if they tell you, I can't do it, or now I'm in real estate, that's awesome, that's great, who are you with, that sort of thing, then that's fine. But you don't put them on the list. So anyway, that's probably the strongest method that I've heard for developing one's sphere of influence. So I'd say in concert, go back to those former clients of yours. That clearly is an area where you can address it. Because I suspect if each of us asked ourselves, when was the last time I talked to them, we could find several people that we could touch base with again, who hopefully were satisfied enough with our services and will appreciate the candor when you talk with them. So sphere of influence was by far number one. Uh, when I talked with Wendy Shaw, she said that's one of the things that we're doing because that's not something that they had placed a lot of emphasis on, you know, with past clients. And they have a boatload of them. 
but she said that's one of the things that we started working on and are seeing some positive results with it. So, you know, that's just one of those things. Open house was the second. You know, out of all of the activities, those were the two that came out the strongest in the polls when we talked to uh, producers and, and uh, top agents. Now, with open houses, and I said I was going to share a story, and some of you have heard this. Um, some of you may know or may have heard Bob Wolf. I don't know if, if uh, you were with Colgo Banker in the days when I brought him in to be a speaker there. And uh, some of us at John Hall before that company was sold. We brought him in also. And Bob is a salesperson who was a big fish in a small pond. And by a big fish in a small pond, he was from Fort Collins, Colorado. And his production, his only, and uh, nobody else, just he as an individual, outproduced the number one company who had over 400 agents. He outproduced the 400 agents. Now, Fort Collins is a small college town. And he said at that time, this is back in the late 80s, but at that time, his production um, was based on an average sales price of about 83 to 84,000. That's what most of the homes were selling for. Well, Bob decided he was going to move either here to Phoenix or to Southern California. And he really was vacillating. He didn't know which one he wanted to go to. And I said, why in the world are you going to give up the dynasty? He said, I'm going to give myself a 400 to 500 percent pay increase. He said, are you kidding? I want to be able to retire by the time I'm 55. Well, I laughed because he will not retire. He, he just won't, and he has, uh, if, if I were to tell stories on him, he's now 60, but, uh, and he's still going strong. His uh, frustration this past year was he set something in excess of $2 million and he fell about 180000 short of his goal, and that really did upset him. It really did, but he forgets that he upped his uh, production a couple of times during the year when he made some changes, so he was certainly way ahead of where he had said initially, but still fell short, and that's what's going to drive him to do even more this year. But anyway, Bob decided he was going to move to Southern California. Well, he moved there in 1989. Now, is there anybody from there who knows what that market was like in 89? No. It was great. It was what? Very good at that time. Oh, no, no. No. No, 1989 was the worst. Yeah, you're thinking, yeah, jump forward 10 years. Yeah, 1989, their market was the worst it has ever been in recorded real estate history. The worst it had ever been. Uh, I was at that time with Cobalt Banker. I referred him to Cobalt Banker, and that's where he went initially. And this isn't to pick on Cobalt Banker, I mean, because this could have been any town, any company, USA, that I'm about to tell you about. But Bob moved over there knowing no one, I mean absolutely, positively, no one. Starting in a brand new market, in a market when it was the worst they had ever seen, ever had. In his first year, he sold over $22 million worth of real estate in the worst market they ever had. And some say, oh yeah, that means what, four homes? No. The average sales price in 1989 was under 300000 It was somewhere around 285 or 289 somewhere in that general vicinity. And in the first year, in the worst market they ever had, knowing no one, he sold $22 million worth of real estate. Now, why he held an open house, this is just one of the activities, he held an open house every day for one year. Now, if you ever want to see him get angry, he won't in front of people that he doesn't know, but he said, what really annoys the heck out of me, I will tell people that, I will share it with them, and they'll say, well, I bet you didn't do it on Super Bowl Sunday. He said, yes, I did. <laughs> I'll bet you didn't do it on Thanksgiving. Yes, I did. He said, uh, I bet you didn't do it on New Year's Day. Yes, I did. He said, I don't know. What part of, I held an open house every day for a year, do they not understand? And he said, I finally got to the point where I thought, you know what, I don't even care to talk to people that are that foolish. And he did hold an open house every day for the first year that he was there. And that's where he made a lot of money. I mean, he really did. Now, does he hold open houses today? No, because he doesn't need to. If he needed to, could he and would he go back to it? Yes. 
you know, so you do what you got to do. And in his case, he was making so much money that he truly no longer had the time for those types of activities. But there is an art to doing a good open house. And sometimes it might be just for an hour. And if nobody showed up, nobody showed up. He'd decide if he had something else he was going to do. But he said, now I could have sat at my home, my own you know, physical home, and I could have done some work, but who's going to find me there? Nobody. Or I could have gone to my geographic you know, real estate office, but who's going to find me there? Nobody. And you know, people talk about opportunity time, floor time, and so forth. I don't know anybody. I don't know anybody who makes enough money to make it worthwhile to do something like that. Some will say, oh yeah, I sold two homes. Good. Over what period of time? Year and a half. Oh, heck of a deal. <laughs> you know, that's, that's really great. And for some, that might be brisk business and that could be good. But he said, I'm not going to go to the office. So he said, instead, what I did was I'd just take everything with me to an open house. And I'd go to that open house because people will want to check it out you know, test the market first, see if there's something out there that they like that they might not otherwise know about, and spend some time there. And if they find a home and say, yeah, if, if we were to sell our house today, we'd want to buy something like this, then they'll list their home. So you have listing possibilities as well as prospective buyers. And whether that buyer purchases that house or another house, if you develop something with them, that's fine. Uh, you know, go sell them something else. It doesn't have to be that home. But that was his primary source of business as he got started. So that was the one thing. The second thing that he did that was extremely effective was geographic farming. You know, and I said that's some of the opportunities that are available for us. Now, here again, he moved to an area that he didn't know. And he's in, still in the same place, you know, over 20 years later, he's still in that same market with Dana Point, you know, in, in that vicinity high rent district. He does quite well there. And he's been in the same location, as I say, since 1989. And so what Bob did was he found a good escrow officer. And that really is one of the big keys. And he said, here's what I'm trying to do. I want to develop some business. I want to do some farming. Help me figure out, you know, what area I need to go to. Now, because he had knowledge and experience on what to do if he generated a lot of business, he had, he wanted a larger farm and he went for a thousand homes. Typically we'll tell you just look at three to four hundred because you've got enough that you have to do in those areas to develop the possibility of some business. But in his case, he let the title company direct him, help him figure it out. He found the mailings that he wanted to work with and here's where he spent a lot of money. He would every week for the first three months, he would send out postcards to them. He went to Lentz Design. He stays with Lentz Design. He happens to love them. And he would do mailings into this uh, area or to these people. So is there a monetary investment? The answer is yes. There absolutely is. But once a week, every week for the first three months, he did mailings on these postcards. So he had the cost of the postcard plus the postage. Uh, fortunately, you know, he had somebody else who would handle the mailing for him. So he himself didn't have to do that part. He does not like grunt work. And so that's what he did. Now, after that first quarter, what he started doing was he dropped off to every third week. And then he dropped off to every other month. But here was the fun part of it. People started calling him saying, you know, you're the, you've been here longer than anybody else and you've been doing more work here than anybody else. We're thinking about selling our home and the market's been bad. We need somebody like you. So here he is, brand spanking new, knows nobody, but he created the appearance, you know, that he wanted to create. People started calling him. So between the open houses and those mailings in the geographic farm, in his first year in a brand new market, worst market they'd ever had, he sold over $22 million worth of real estate. Now, when I talked to Bob, he said, honest to goodness, if I were starting out today, or even trying to refresh, he said, I just pretend, you know what, just got to town, don't know anybody. And he said, I'd go right back to that because I'm telling you, it works. And so, you know, here again, just some ideas for you. It's going to cost a little bit of money. Now, the other thing is with his postcards, you know, you can get the three by five cards. He doesn't want those. He likes the five by sevens. 
And the why is because they're bigger, they're easier to read. He said, especially even on me now, my eyes are getting bad. Well, he gets no sympathy from me if I were to admit to being older than he is. But um, anyway, he, he just likes the big ones. And the funny part with what he does, the message on the back of the postcard is always the same. It just, it's got his photograph, it's branded with his company, you know, the contact information, and it says, past performance is no guarantee of the future, but what else can you go by? That's always the same message. Nothing on the back part of it ever changes. The front of it is what changes because they've got so many different messages on there. Like one of them that I still remember I like, it's a, it shows a gold shovel stuck in a mound of dirt. And it says, when you find yourself in a hole, quit digging. You know, th that type of thing. And it, it, there are just so many. And they really are fun. I mean, they really are fun. I have a whole group of them, you know, that I keep because the sayings are so good. You know, um, what is it? Uh, you're going to get run over if you sit on the same track and don't move. Uh, you know, um, you know, as a train comes by, I've, I've forgotten some of them. But anyway, I've, I've even got several of them. If I have some time, you know, I can run in and, and get some of them and share them with you and let you see them because they really are fun. But anyway, those are some of the things that he does. The unrepresented sellers, when you want to talk about somebody like that, how many of you in here continually, consistently, and persistently work for sale by owners or unrepresented sellers? One. Okay, just one. We think that's a market that's over overtapped. It isn't. Most of us will not work for sale by owners. Why? Let's be honest. I mean, just, just talk to me a little bit. Why? Because they think they're, they're too hard to talk to. They won't. They'll turn, them, they'll turn you off. They'll give you a thousand excuses why they're not going to use a real estate agent. They can sell it themselves. They'll save the commission. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. blah, blah. Yeah. And they're overpriced. And, okay. They're, they're overpriced. overpriced. Yep. And sometimes that's the case. Yeah. What I always have fun with is I say, they eat their young. <laughs> and we think that because oftentimes, just like you said, they'll snap at you or they'll holler at you because, you know what, they're afraid of ha having a good salesperson talk to them because they're going to run out of excuses. But most of us are at instant gratification junkies. We want what we want when we want it now. And many times you'll hear you know, our peers say, well, I didn't do it because it takes too much time. Well, yeah, it does. But what doesn't in our industry? And the rewards can be great if you will stick with them. Yes? I was going to say, I've got about five or six questions that I ask them, and it's tough for the most part to get through to your sixth question. They'll turn you off. Most, mostly it's going to be, you know, you'll finally get an answer. You're too pushy. Stop it. And I'll say, wouldn't it be great if you had someone like me working for you? Wouldn't you want someone working that hard? And that turns you around. Not all the time. It doesn't have to be all the time. Sure. Well, and you're not going to get them all anyway. No. We're not going to get everything that we go after anyhow. But now you can change your mindset, too, when it comes to something like that. And I say, change your mindset, because you say, oh, I lost that listing. Well, ask yourself another question. How can I lose something I never had? I didn't have it to begin with. And there may be some times when no matter what they say or do, you find them disgusting and you don't want to work with them. And that's okay, too. So anyway, those those are some of the things. Yes, Dan. Is there a way to locate them? Because I've been trying to, you know, other than just driving the neighborhood, and just usually the time. Yeah. Okay, typically now, and and it's an interesting question. Typically, there are two ways that you usually are going to find the for sale by owners, and that is driving the neighborhoods to identify them, and or the ads that they place in the paper. Now, there are some companies out there that say, "I'll sell you a list." Well, guess where they get them? <laughs> Same place you can get them. It's just sometimes, you know, me personally, I'm not going to pay somebody to give me something like that. That's one of the areas where I would draw a line. So that really is the, the primary way that you're going to find them. Um, yeah? I was going to say, uh, to contradict a bit what you said, I do pay for a service. Okay. Very inexpensive. For $70 a month, you can get all the expires and all the physicals every day. Okay. Holy cow, for $70 a month, you can't make one sale out of that list 
every month. It's a long. Okay. Good. See, and, and the thing that I really like about this, and it's not contradicting, it's just you have a different way of doing it. And would I change my mind if I were doing it today? Maybe. Um, you know, and, and like I say, I'm, I'm not cheap, but I'm thinking, okay, is that something I'm going to do? So good. So for $70 a month, that's fine. If, if that's something that's going to be helpful and beneficial. So that's good. Um, okay, if we go back to a little bit of this, leveraging your market efforts at open houses. Now, here are just some <coughs> ideas. It says use an easy approach with your feature sheets. In other words, when you put flyers together, and a lot of your title companies will do this for you, where you give them a digital picture, and they'll personalize it, they'll put some photos together, and they'll give you some of these things. Well, one of the first suggestions is hand carry that feature sheet to the neighbors, along with an invitation <coughs> to the open house. In other words, just take it. And you can put, a, you know, a business card or something on there and just say, you know, we're going to be holding an open house this day or that day or which days and what time to let them know. Hand carry it to them. That's going to shock the daylights out of people because they're not used to us getting up off of our butt and doing anything. You know, so to have somebody literally knock on their door and do this is interesting. Yes, Frank. I do that. I walk the neighborhood with invites and I do that. Six months ago, I did one, and I just got a call from one of the neighbors wanting to buy a condo for their son. Excellent. Yeah, and, and they wouldn't hesitate in calling you because you introduced yourself. I mean, they get to know you, which is a heck of a lot better than a mailing that means nothing to them, so they throw it away. The other thing that can be kind of interesting when you do something like this with an open house is make it a snooty deal. And when I say a snooty deal, what's fun is if you say what I'm doing is inviting the neighbors first to a private showing. I mean, I really do like that, to a private showing. And, you know, we're not even going to put the signs out for the public. We want you to be able to select your neighbors. And you say, well, why would I want to do that? Okay, there are some people in areas who say, you know what, I love the neighborhood, I love the area, but the house is just too big. So maybe they're thinking of downsizing. This could be the right home for them. Or maybe their family has expanded, and now they're looking for something larger. This could be the home for them. They have family, friends, business associates, and people that might be interested. So yeah, you definitely want them to know. And when you start telling them, well, we'll have a private showing, especially with refreshments. They love refreshments. You know, so you can do that. Now, it can be as simple as going to Costco and buying some of those little lemon bites. Or, oh, they're brownies. Their brownies are good, too. <laughs> I mean, what, you know, it can, it's not something where you have to spend a lot of money. You have to bake it and do all of these things yourself. You can take it over. And if you have something like that, it's interesting because you know that old thing where we say, feed them and they will come? It works. So that's one thing. It also says when the house goes under contract, you take that same feature sheet with another note, and the note's basically going to say, okay, we have this home, you know, reserved, or we have this home pending. Uh, we have, you know, this home sold, however you care to, you know, describe it at that point. And we have buyers who are looking for homes in the area. Have you considered selling yours? Because here's something else that NAR tells us in their property or their profiles for buyers and sellers, is that when a home sells in a neighborhood, there are typically three to five more listings within the next quarter that come up in that area. That has statistically remained the same for a long time. So if you're doing like Frank is doing and you're out there and you're right introducing now. and pardon me? Right uh-huh. Yeah, well, as of 2012, that's it's still the same thing. So yeah, so that's one of the things that you want to look at. Um, because you know what? Especially now when they're hearing nothing about it's a seller, but it's a seller's market, it's a seller's market, prices are going up. Now are they the same as they were in 2006? The answer is no. But here again, is it going to happen in every area? The answer is no. But you know, how do I know which area it's going to happen in and which area it's not going to happen in? And how it's going to impact them at some future point in time. So, you know, that's the thought. Now, the other thing is if you have other flyers left, when it actually closes, uh, then you can take it out and you can ask the seller's permission and you can put a note on there thanking the sellers, or if you if you happen to know the buyer and you want to give them a little bit of information, you know, meet your new neighbors or something of this sort. In other words, you can use those leftover flyers instead of saying, oh gosh, I've got 300 left, and just throw them out. Use it to work for you. You know, that can be an effective um, thing to do for an open house also. Now, 
some of the other things when it talks about leveraging your marketing efforts in the community support. Uh, this, this can not only be something that you can work with when it comes to open houses, but also when it comes to geographic farming and, you know, developing some farms. You know, what we find is a lot of us will go out there and say, well, I'll sponsor one of the kids' soccer teams or, you know, their little league team or the scouts group or something of this sort. So we'll have a t-shirt printed up for them and then we'll put some information about us on there or at least make sure that they know that we did it, but we're not really involved. And we're saying, no, if you're going to get involved, you know, don't just sponsor them. Push it out. Get involved with the schedules, with the agendas. And, you know, let those people, being their parents and the others in the neighborhood, know that here's somebody who cares above and beyond, you know, just spending a couple hundred dollars on a shirt or something of this sort. You know, let them know. Because that, now we, if we go back to the adages once again, how often have you heard somebody say it's not, or they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And that'll make a big difference also. Um, it says target your prospects. In other words, you've got to have some data that is accessible, um, relevant, updated, but even more important, it's got to be used. There are a lot of programs out there that many of us, you know, subscribe to and buy, but then we don't use it. And you think, gosh, I don't care if it's $30 a month, if it's $70 a month, you know, all the, the best systems in the world won't mean a thing and you can't do a thing if you're not using it. So that's one of the things that we really want to concentrate on. Um, it says to use our relationships to, you know, target people in the market and work with them. Uh, use your commonality. If and when you hear that somebody you know has just been promoted or maybe just had a child, uh, something, you know, that may come up that way, send them a note, pick up the phone. But keep in mind, too, the most effective means of communication is always face-to-face. It always has been, and it always will remain that way, face to face. It's very hard for somebody to reject you looking you in the eyes. So that's something you want to work with. Um, on relationship marketing, again, we're saying have a meaningful database. Referral marketing, now this again, this is something when we talked in the very beginning about the Generation X and Generation Y, they are big into relationship marketing. They really are. Now, even the baby boomers are because, you know, they like to feel comfortable with whomever it is that they're working with. The matures are really big on that. So, you know, we start talking about this. One of the things you can do if you haven't been doing it or haven't done it is ask your clients for referrals. You know, just to ask them, you know, were you happy with the job I did? Yes. Or oh, would you mind putting something in writing? A lot of you have gotten to the point where you'll actually have them go on to um, a blog, you know, and put a testimonial there so that anybody who, you know, has friended you can see it and read it. That does a lot. We're hearing a lot of positive results, you know, from people that way too. Uh, follow up again with the past clients, the testimonials and the references mean a lot. You know, they don't know you, but gosh, they're reading about you. How many of you have ever gone to a, a, a timeshare that you've rented? And in that office or in the living room, they've got a book where past uh, tenants have said things about it. Here's a great place to go. This is a good restaurant. How many of you read it? <coughs> All of us. I mean, we really do. Well, who knows? I might pick up a helpful little hint here and, and or a restaurant that I wouldn't have known about otherwise. Well, it's, it has the same effect when they start looking through the things that we have available for them to look at. Uh, and it also says, don't forget about agent-to-agent -agent referrals. You know, in here, how many of you are from the Far West Valley? Okay, how many of you are from the Southeast Valley? And how many of you are from Scottsdale? How many from um, Glendale? Yeah, and, and what I'm saying is, see, in this room alone, we cover a lot of space. And I don't know about you, but if somebody called me today, I mean, forget the fact that I haven't been listing and selling for a while, but if they called me today and said, I've got this property over in uh, um, Gilbert that I need to sell, I don't know that I would know how to get there. <laughs> and I'm not being funny. I, I, I don't know Gilbert. 
I don't know. Yeah, you do. You'll take the referral. Twenty miles from here. All right. <laughs> okay. So okay. So forty miles. Okay, that's good. So it's forty miles from here, and without traffic being heavy, how long would it take you to get from here to there? Well, I left at nine, so it took me a little over an hour because of the traffic. And the... Okay, and that isn't even at rush hour time. No, I left at nine, so you figure it was kind of. Yeah, so what we're looking at is a minimum of two hours travel time just to get there and back, probably closer to three hours. So I've got to ask myself, can I go over there and sell? And the answer is yes. Now the other question is, should I? Not me. And you guys can do it if you want to, but I would far rather refer that Gilbert person to you and have you in turn refer somebody back to me. I didn't even know where Hearst, Texas was. And I had a client, a former client, call and say, you know, um, we've got a brother who lives in Hearst, Texas. Can you refer us to somebody there to help him sell his house? And I said, you bet. I didn't even know where the heck it was. So I wrote to two different realtors that I know. One is in Austin and the other in Dallas-Fort Worth. And I asked them, you know, is this someplace near you? Now, could I have looked it up? Sure, but why bother? I want them to know I'm thinking about them. And I accomplished a heck of a lot more. So anyway, one of them called back. Yeah, here's where it is. I don't work that area. However, here's somebody who does. Well, yesterday, I'm not teasing with this. Yesterday, a check arrived here for $1,843.75, if I were counting, from the realtor who was with the Century 21 in Hearst, Texas, and she sold the house. You know, that's wonderful. So what did I get? I did two emails, one to Austin, one to Dallas, Fort Worth, found her, a little bit of time, well, you know, I'll take $1,843.75 every day. Um, but that's what I'm saying, take advantage of it, even in our local communities. I'm not going to spend the time to drive over there, because once I get there, I don't know where I'm going anyway, and some say, well, you've got GPS, good. If you want to do it, you can. I just think my time is far more productive spending that two to three hours here in my market area developing some business than, than it is there. But So it's going to be a personal preference. Now, some of the other things, and these are just silly but fun things that you can do. When you talk about, okay, how do you market some of these properties, what do you do? And we're saying, you know what, you can have some parties, you can get press coverage, you know, depending on how you're doing it and where you're doing it and what you're doing with it, just call and, and or send something into the press. And when they have a slow news day, which is often, uh, you know, they'll publish some of these things for you. Uh, you can also conduct the client focus groups, and I'll share that in a minute. But when I say have some fun, here's a, a, a realtor that his wife sold Tupperware. And she kept saying, well, come on, you got to help me. So what he decided to do was he decided to have a Tupperware party at a listing he was wanting to showcase and get sold. He sent it out to other realtors. He sent it out to some of his clients. He sent it out.